says again that we want our application to not be off doing other stuff and ignoring the user interface. So therefore we're going to separate things in the threads and the Java virtual machine then will sort of rotate between the threads that we have running ensuring that everyone gets a little bit of time. It's almost like, you know, when you talk about multitasking on a computer, all right, you know, I'm listening to iTunes while I'm running the Chrome browser, while I have a Word document open, I could be doing things in possibly all the windows at the same time. A computer, you know, a single processor, rather, can only handle one thing at a time. Well, how does it do it? Well, it, it is sort of a round robin between, and that's called multitasking. Think of multi-threading as being like multitasking, but within a single task. And that single task is a Java virtual machine, and I'm giving, um, and we're having um, threads inside of that one task, and the Java virtual machine sort of round robins between those. The upshoot of that is we can still have our app be reactive to the user input and still do other things in the background. And um, so that's sort, of, that's sort of critical. It wasn't such an issue in the first one because we really didn't do anything that was like that intensive. You know, if we're, we did the temperature uh, conversion, I, no, um, what do we do? Oh, a tip calculator and some other things. You know, that, it's not really clicking a button and doing a little bit of math. That's not going to tie up the processor for so long that it won't be able to react to, to that. But some of the things that we're getting into now are a little more intensive. All right, so let's run the Canon game and let's take a look at it, and then we'll go through this. I do have the the your next assignment up here in my head, and I know well you have the solution up there in your head too. So so we're even. But I will have it. I just need to write it up. I just need to formalize it. Uh, fortunately, um, I, I don't think. Uh, anyone is like dying for work in this class. I think there's, there's assignments that need to be turned in first, so it's not as though you're waiting on me. So within the next day or, or so, I should have that one up. So here's a Canon game. And I'm gonna run out of time before I get over here. But I can start out the second round. All right. If we see, I'll hit reset. We have a cannon that we can aim. And as we move our hand or finger around the screen, we can aim it. A single tap aims it. So when I tap it once, it aims it. A swipe aims it. This is some of the gestures that you have. We're going to one of the things we're talking about in this lab also is gestures. So one of the gestures we have is a single touch, single tap. All right. Another gesture we have is a swipe, where we move our finger from there. Both of those aim the cannon. To shoot it, we do, darn it, a double tap. All right, let's try it again. We get more time if we hit it, so we, I'm going to win this round, just the competitive part of me, shoot. All right. Ah! Darn it. All but one. So you get the idea. So what this lab is about is this lab is about processing gestures, um, and this lab is about multi-threading. And a little bit of the audio, too. We have those little, little audio clips that you probably could hear um, as we were doing it. There's another gesture that we're not talking about in this lab. I don't think so, which is the long press. That's when I go and press and I hold down on the screen. I don't think we do anything special for the long press in, in this example. So let's take a look, uh, let's take a look at this. And it's almost like, if you think about it, you can sort of see what's coming for some of these things. Guess what? There's going to be a listener. 
that listens for these gestures and grabs a gesture and does something based on what gesture we've done. So just like there is a click listener for a button or a text change listener, there's going to be a gesture listener that's going to listen for gestures to be made on the screen. All right. So let's look at the code here. Thankfully, they had another adapter, which is probably my adapter that I forgot last week or something. But at any rate, let's go down the line and look at some of the stuff uh, for this. We got our strings file. Don't think there's anything unusual in there. Uh, about the only thing that's unusual here is we actually have a little format that we're going to use to display the results. Um, shots fired, blank, total time blank. So we use that sort of as a template to format the, um, the, the string that says that. But other than that, it's the same as before. Well, time remaining is the same way. We, we, we show time remaining to the point one second, to the tenth of a second. Manifest, I don't think anything unusual in there. Nope, doesn't look like it. Raw, all right. Here we have some wave files. Each of these files corresponds to the sounds that make. If we hit, if we shoot the cannon, if we hit one of the target things that go back and forth, or if we hit the thing that is blocking the bar that goes This bar that goes up and down here is the blocker. So if we hit that. Oh, I forgot it's a double tap. Ah. There's a different sound that that makes. All right. And that's called the blocker. So we have our three sounds that correspond to shooting cannon, hitting the target, hitting the blocker. Our layout, we have a main XML. Yes. Is raw where all the sounds go? Yeah, all the wave files, yeah. All the, yeah, all the sounds. Um, let's, let's Google to get maybe a better answer to that. Oh, a raw input stream. That's what the raw stands for. Right. Arbitrary files to save in their raw form to open these resources with a raw in input stream. Okay. We could also put some of these in the assets. If you need access to original file names and file hierarchy, you might consider saving some in the assets directory. Um, files in assets are not given a resource ID, so you can read them only using the asset manager. Um, we've actually seen an example of this in the, the one last week where we had the flags, where actually the name of the flag sort of encoded information about the image file. There was a region, and there was the name of the country, and all that. So I think what they're telling us is we wouldn't put those in raw, uh, but we would put uh, if we wanted to do something similar, we could put these WAV fi uh, files in the assets folder. All right. Now, you might think, wow, all those things going on on the screen. We've got the blocker going up and down. We've got the target going blocking up and down. We have the cannon. we got the cannonball. The view for this is going to be really complicated. Huh. You might think that. But lo and behold, no, almost nothing in the view. All right. Huh? What is this trickery? Well, 
we actually have defined a custom view of our own, and that is the canon view. All right. Remember, there are basic views that are built into the Android framework. There's the layout views, there's the linear uh, layout, there's the table, there's all these different things that are built in, and we can construct our GUI using those things. All right. But in this case, essentially, what we have is sort of a black, uh, a blank canvas. All right, and we're controlling the actions of those things. We're moving them around the screen, so it's not like we have a button in a stationary place. We're programmatically moving the targets. We're programmatically moving the cannon, moving the bullet, and all that. So essentially, we just want a blank slate that we can draw on. All right, and that's what we're going to do with this case. We, we're going to have some. We're going to have a blank screen that we're going to draw stuff on. And that's defined as a custom view, all right, which is called the canon view. And we can see up here, nope, not up there. I clicked the wrong place. Up here, we'll see that's one of the classes that we have. We have a canon view, which, if we look at the code, it extends surface view which is, again, sort of a blank, uh, 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 blank slate to write on. Plus, we've added some attributes. So we're extending it. Our view inherits from just the blank surface view, and we're adding stuff on it. Namely, we're adding objects for the cannon, for the cannonball, for the target, for the blocker. All right. Plus a, a whole slew of um, instance variables as well. All right. So that's the view that gets created when, um, when we go and run this. All right, anything else fancy? Not really. We have an icon, and we're good to go. All right. We have a line class that we're going to use for a couple different things. And interestingly enough, all this line class does is defines a starting point and an ending point. All right. So if you can imagine, we have a bunch of lines in this example, and we'll see how we use this. But we have, I wish I could freeze the screen almost. All right. We have a line for the blocker. We have a line for each one of these. So we have a bunch of lines. So to simplify things, we put that stuff in a class. All right, a starting point and an ending point. So now we have a little line class that we can do stuff with. Again, the whole idea of, of reusability and taking and encapsulating some basic stuff in a class that we can use over and over again. All right, so nothing too exciting there. All we have is a line class. In the line class is a constructor where we... Um, actually set, initialize the points at zero, zero for both the start and the end. I don't like this class. Why don't I like this class? See if anyone can take a guess. It doesn't do much, but that's, that's, that's nothing really to hold against it. You know, there's a lot, you know, there's a lot of, a lot of things out there that don't do much, but they're still okay. You know, yeah, I don't like the fact that these points are defined as public because then outside of it can go and manipulate those objects directly. And they probably did that for convenience, but that is, that's, that's bad form in my book. Uh, attributes should be private or protected, and there should be methods. So if I want to manipulate that point, Maybe there's a get starting point method, or a get ending point method, or set starting point, set ending point, or something like that, but not making those public. So, um, were I grading this, I'd probably deduct a point and tell them to resubmit for full credit. All right. Okay. Other than that, it is what it is. Nothing earth shattering, but it does encapsulate a bit of behavior. We then have our whoops. We then have our view, 
which inherits from surface view. And this represents, this is again a custom view, this is a view that we created. So a surface view is a blank canvas. We extended that to have all these things on it, like all the, like all the, all the objects that are moving around the screen on it. And then we have the game, um, Java, which is sort of the boss, which sort of manages everything and runs everything. So it's going to create that view, all right? And it's going to handle some other stuff. For example, it's going to handle uh, gesture detection, all right? So in this way, notice that there's not tons of stuff in this game class. This game class is sort of the boss and it manipulates the view that it creates. But it handles sort of the um, basics, uh, the bookkeeping, and it sort of provides the environment for the view to do its thing. So let's see what we do. We create, on create we call the super functions um, on create method, all right. We set the content view to be main, all right, that's this guy, which creates one of these objects, a canon view object. We grab a pointer to that, just like we did with images and buttons and anything else in our examples, we can grab a pointer to it by saying canon view, find view by ID, canon view. We then create a gesture listener, all right? The, um, our gest yeah, gesture uh, detector. And what that's going to do is it's going to associate with this, it's going to handle the gestures that we have, all right? That's what I want to cover first off today, is making sure we, we understand the way the gestures work and the way the gestures get handled. Now again, this is the boss, right? And the boss, you know, um, a good boss, in my mind, doesn't do all the work themselves, right? That's actually kind of a problem when the boss micromanages and does everything, right? Or, or tries to get their fingers in everything. Probably a better way to put it. It's best when a boss delegates responsibility, right? And just sort of oversees the process. Now, I know that's me editorializing, all right, a little bit. Um, but... I'm saying it because, first of all, I believe it's true, all right? And second of all, that's a good analogy with this code. In other words, this code, the code in this function, which is sort of the boss that sort of runs the show, isn't going to do a lot of the stuff like actually fire the cannonball or um, process or, or aim the cannon. It's going to call methods on the view to do that, all right? So it's delegating, it's sort of directing the flow. It's handling the gestures, but then it's calling methods on the view to, uh, to, to handle it and to do things. So if we look down here, we have a couple of things. We have an on pause if the application is paused. On destroy, what we do when, when things get destroyed, we release all the resources. Then we have an on touch event, which is a new event. All right. You can touch any view, right? And this method, when it gets called, it gets past an event, all right? So what we do is we look to see what that event is. That's what we're doing here. The argument of this function is the event. We grab the action from that event, and the action relates to which of the gestures we just made. And remember, we said there was four of them. There is, or actually there, there, there's probably, yeah, there's four of them. There's the single touch, the double touch, the swipe, and the long touch. All right? So we're looking to see, first of all, if we have done a touch or if we've done a swipe. Because if we've done a touch or a swipe, that means we want to move the cannon. So again, we don't have code in here to move the cannon, 
we simply tell the cannon view to go move the cannon. All right? So on this level of abstraction, the cannon view encapsulates everything about that view. It knows about moving the cannon and shooting the cannon and moving the targets and moving the blocker. So this guy being the boss simply tells, hey, we have a gesture that means you should aim the cannon, so go and aim the cannon. And we pass that, the event that triggered all this off. We then call the gesture t detectors on touch event method which we've defined over here, which we have actually a series of four events, or, or a series of four methods that we could call. In this case, the on double tap, we fire the cannon. Now this is a little goofy here, and I'm not 100% sure why they did it this way except maybe simply to demonstrate a couple of, of examples of, of handling gestures. Because they handle the gesture on the on-touch event of our Java class. And for certain gestures, we go and we tell the view to go do its thing. All right? So this is the on-touch event of, the, of our activity. And we look and we see, is the action that was performed a tap or a swipe? That's action down, action move. So a swipe or a touch. And if it's one of those two, we tell the cannon to go aim itself. We then call the on touch event method on the gesture detector. And we have code in here that says, on double tap, do something else. Fire the cannonball. It would make more sense to me to have all of this stuff in the gesture listener. So I'm not really sure why they didn't do that. All right? In other words, we could have in here Quick, what the name of the function is, and try. We could have an on down method to indicate that the user And we could we 
to do that. All right. I'm not really sure why they handled the one kind of gesture and the activities on touch event, and they handled the other one as part of the simple gesture listener. So we could, it would seem to me to be a better practice to move those down into, um, into the, um, into the gesture listener. In fact, what I'm going to do is I'm going to do that and pray that it still works. The swipe is actually called a fling. Now with the fling, there's more parameters that get passed, right? Because with a fling, you actually have a starting position, an ending position, plus the speed that you fling. And it might actually, you could actually have code to, depending on how fast you swipe, do an action harder or softer. In other words, let's say you're, change, you're, you're reading an e-book and you slowly pass your finger over it, it might flip one page. If you frantically go very quickly, it might flip ten pages at a time, for example. So, I'm going to go, I'm going to comment out this code, just on the odd chance that I, I screwed something up or didn't realize exactly why they did it that way and then I find out why exactly why they did it that way and I move the code into the gesture listener. That makes sense for me because then again all the gesture processing is done in one place and that seems neater as opposed to like well half of it happens here half of it happens there. All right. So let's make sure it still works now that I've moved it. All right, still aims when I press it. Still aims when I swipe it. It swipes it a slightly different though. It doesn't do it as continuously. It sort of snaps when I'm done swiping it. Possibly that's why they did it. I don't know. But I'm pretty happy to say the functionality is, is the same as it was before. So that makes sense to me to do it that way. All right. And if I'm not mistaken, that is about all that is in the Java class, the activity. All right. This is sort of a continuation of the theme that we covered um, way back uh, when I did my simple tip calculator, right? If you remember, my event handlers didn't have much code in them. They simply called methods on other classes, all right? Again, that's sort of the boss function, right? It doesn't necessarily do the work itself. It, it delegates that responsibility to other classes within it. So all my gesture and event listeners, really there's not a lot of code on them. It simply goes and calls code on someone else. So really the activity in this case is real simple. All we have is our content view. We grab a pointer to the content view. We create a gesture detector. Um, we set the volume, I guess, or, or we, uh, yeah, we allow, um, we allow there to be music. And we do some basic housekeeping on destroy and so on. On touch event, 
we actually call our gesture detector to handle all the events. The tap, the swipe, and the double tap. And we really don't write a lot of code there. We simply invoke methods on the view. All right. So this part of it is easy. Now, the work has to be done somewhere, and that's where we're going to get into the view. And that's where the complexity of this guy really lies, in the view. Question? Um, that is a good question. Java definitely does have a garbage collector. I think the reason for those, the destroy, is um, because those audio files that are, that are streaming. In other words, you don't want, you know, I would think we could even, well, that would be hard to, that would be hard to get timing just right. But if we destroyed it, I'm thinking that it might still be pointing to those files that it's streaming. And I, I'm, I'm guessing that's the reason for that. I, I have to say I'm a little fuzzy on that, but I'm, I'm pretty certain that, that, that that's why um, that's in there. But yeah, Java definitely has garbage collection. Does everybody know what garbage collection is? All right. Garbage collection is this. All right. We create objects. Objects live on the heap. All right. What creates an object? Well, there's a lot of activities that create an object. Typically, it corresponds to somewhere in our code having a new statement. So we create objects like here. This is creating an object. All right. It's creating an object of type gesture detector, and we're storing a pointer of it in our variable called gesture detector. Now, variables in Java contain a pointer to where the object actually is. So we have our heap. This is where the objects get created. And our stack is where things like the instance variable and, uh, and other stuff live. All right? So if we had a line of code that says something like this, let's say I have a class called canon. And let's say I have a chunk of code that says canon C. That doesn't create a canon object. That simply says that my variable C is going to, at some point in time, point to a canon. All right? What creates the canon object would be the new. So if I said C equals new canon, what that does is that creates a canon object on the heap. And we then store a pointer as that variable on the stack to point to this location in memory, whatever that happens to be. So this points to that canon object. All right. So if I say canon D, D equals C, I'm not actually creating a new canon object. I'm simply pointing the variable d also to this object. All right. So now I have two variables. Both of them point to the same object. All right. So when I do an assignment, when I do really any statement in Java with a variable, I'm doing it with the pointer. All right. So now I have two objects pointing to it. Now, let's say I did this. Let's say I had canon E. Then I said E equals new canon. What does that do? Well, that creates another canon object on the heap because I invoke the new statement and it points E to it. So, if I were to say 
C equals E, D equals E, I would change that C and D object reference pointer to no longer point to this guy, but to point to this guy. At this point, this object lives out on the heap, but no one points to it. C and D used to point to it, but it doesn't point to it anymore. It points to that new object. All right? That object is, you know, hate to sound like the Sopranos, but that's dead to us, right? There's no way we can reference that. Nothing is pointing to it. We can't ever reference that object again. So in a sense, it's garbage. All right? It, no one points to it. It's, it's unusable. We can't use anything for it. Periodically, within Java, it will look to see if there's any objects on the heap that nothing points to. And if nothing points to it, then it's going to clear it out. It's going to release that memory and, and make that memory available for something else. Okay? So when we talk about garbage collection, what we're talking about is as long as something points to an object on the heap, that object's going to stay alive, all right? And because we can access it, we can do stuff with it. After we remove the last reference to an object, it's effectively dead to us, all right? It may still actually be out in memory for a little tiny period of time until Java catches up with it. But as soon as the Java garbage collection scheme notices that, hey, no one's pointing to that, it's going to take it out. All right, so that's what we mean by garbage collection. And that's why the question came in, hey, how come we have to do that? Doesn't Java just take care of that on its own? And the answer is, yeah, Java does take care of that on their own, but I'm thinking because these are audio streams, that's a little bit different case and we have to handle it a little bit differently. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it, 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 cleans out, uh, it cleans out the uh, uh, memory in the heap for objects that no longer have a reference. So if we, if we eliminate all the references to an object, then that object is gone. And it will physically be deleted at some point from the heap and that, that memory will be reclaimed. You know, you, you sometimes hear, um, you, you know, you sometimes hear of a uh, application having a memory leak, all right? And that could be because of poor coding. You keep object references around when you don't really need them anymore. And because the object references around, Java doesn't know that it can get rid of it. So even though you're not really going to use it anymore, you still got a reference to it, and therefore it's going to, you know, it's going to gradually your memory is going to increase um, and so on. So if you're done with an object, what you can do is you can null out that object. Simply say, like if I was done with that E object, I could say E equals null and I could get rid of it. This, by the way, brings up uh, another thing that for Java that's important. Um, and that is when you get the air null object reference. I know that this, this doesn't relate directly to this uh, problem, but since we're talking about memory and object references and garbage collection, it's relevant to talk about this now. Remember, when we create this, when we execute this, we are not creating an object yet. All right? Only when we say new canon are we actually creating an object. So, that would create the object and that would point C to it. Now, somewhere in our code we could say C equals null. And that would mean that, hey, this C doesn't point to any object. The object it used to point to might still stay there if other variables point to it, or it might disappear due to garbage collection. 
If subsequent to that I try to call a function on C, C shoot cannon, I'll get a no object reference. That is, I'm trying to do something on an object that, and that object reference variable doesn't point to a valid object. All right? So that's what we mean when we see a null object reference. And, and, and you know, if you do any Java programming for any length of time, you will see those errors because it's easy to forget to initialize or you forgot you did something or whatever. And you try to refer to something that you think you have a variable for, but that variable doesn't point to a real object. We declared the variable to point to, uh, to be of that type, but we're not actually pointing to a valid object. All right, our attention now turns to the canon view. And this is going to be the complicated one, right? If the boss don't do the work, someone has to do the work. Well, this is the guy that gets to do the work in this case. If we look at this, we have a thread The thread sort of controls the iteration and the looping of the game. And it's in a separate thread so that we can still devote time to the user gestures. So, again, if I run this, if I run this, there's processing involved moving those things around, right? If that was eaten up all of the time, all right, then it wouldn't be able to process it if I aim the cannon, right? It, it could be if it's busy moving it or when I click this, if it wasn't like paying attention to both things, drawing the screen, and is the user touching the screen, then you're liable to get that, you know, application not responding error. Because if it's dealing just with the movement of the objects on the screen, it might not be able to listen for the users. We do that and we accomplish that via a thread, which is what we have here. All right. We have an activity to display the game over dialogue in the GUI thread. We'll come to that later on. We have some constants for gameplay. We have, um, this is just for maintainability. Um, we have the number of pieces in the target. We have the penalty if you miss. We have the reward if you hit. So you get two seconds deducted. If you miss, you get three seconds rewarded if you hit. We have a boolean that says, is the game over? How much time is left? How many shots were fired? How much time has elapsed? All right. We then have stuff that relates to the blocker and the target. And the cannon and the cannonball. And then some other stuff. All right. For the blocker, we use our line object for the blocker. Again, that's a start and end point. The distance the blocker is from the left, the distance from the top. So, actually, in this case, the distance from the top changes. The distance from the left is constant. So, the, we're going to change the one, but not change the other. Pardon me? Yeah, that, that's, just, that's just the way this game, this game works. In other words, that blocker goes back and forth like that. All right? It doesn't move in and out or whatever. All right? You could do it that way, but then it would be, it would be a different game. All right? and, when, you know, and, and you know, after we go through this, maybe we'll play around with it. Maybe we'll make it go a little bit sideways too. All right? 
and, and give the uh, give the blocker a little more uh, randomness in it to make it for a more interesting game, right? But again, the way this game is written now, the blocker just goes up and down. That's the way that it was defined. And likewise, the target just goes up and down. We have a velocity of the blocker. And we have a blocker multiplier. Apparently the blocker moves faster, which I didn't know. I didn't notice that. All right, interesting. Target, we have the same thing. Um, with the target, it's a line. We have the distance from the left, the distance from the top. The length of each target piece, if you remember, we start out with seven pieces. This is how big one of the pieces are. Um, and again, an initial target velocity and a, uh, a multiplier. We have the width of the target and blocker. We have a hit state that indicates um, for each piece, has it been hit or not. So this is a, an array that has six elements in it, or I'm sorry, seven elements in it. And initially, they would all be set to false, right? Because each we haven't hit any of them yet. And then as we hit them, it would change the value of that. And again, we do this so we know whether to draw or not draw the segment. All right, cannonball. We have a point that represents a cannonball. That actually represents the upper left corner of the cannonball, the point. We have a velocity, an x and y velocity. In other words, if I was smart, I'd give like two hours on the duration of this so I could just keep it running all the time and, and just fire it. But maybe next time I'll do that. Notice my cannon is angled. So if I shoot the cannon, it goes in a diagonal. Which, another way of saying that by traveling in diagonal is it actually has a velocity horizontal and a velocity vertical. So if you remember your physics classes and vectors and all that, and I, I don't recall, you, are, is your background physics? Martin? Okay. Yeah, I, I did too, and, and this is probably about as much as I remember, so you can correct me if I'm wrong. But if we consider velocity, of the cannonball, if we shoot it and it's going like that, actually that velocity has a x component, or actually a y component, and an x component. So what we're doing, and this is why we have a velocity um, broken down into two parts for the cannon, is because we can shoot diagonally. Notice that for the blocker and the target, we only have one velocity. That's because it's only moving vertically. So there's zero horizontal velocity for that. It's just going boom, 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 up and down. Whereas the cannonball, we have an x and y uh, velocity because we can shoot on a diagonal. And a diagonal, you know, velocity can be broken down into its y and x vector. So if the velocity is v this way, we can store that as having a horizontal velocity and a vertical velocity. All right. We have an instance variable saying if the cannonball is on the screen. All right. No automatic gunfire in this game. All right. So if we're shooting something... We can't shoot again. All right. So 
we need to know if, if the cannonball's on the screen. And if the cannonball's on the screen, we can't shoot again. The size of the cannonball, the speed of the cannonball, the base rate, uh, then we get into the cannon, which is um, there's a base to the cannon and there's a barrel to the cannon. All right. This is the base, the semicircle here, and this little thing that sticks out is the barrel. Actually, when we aim the cannon, we are moving that barrel as we touch and move the cannon. The base stays constant and we're turning that barrel at a certain angle. And that angle then will be used to calculate the horizontal and, and uh, vertical velo uh, velocity of the cannonball that we shoot. All right, we set some variables for the sounds. We have three sounds, the target being hit, the cannon being shot, and the blocker being hit. And we then have a little sound map that maps those integers into a particular sound. We then have paint variables used to draw the items on the screen. All right. This is a little confusing, but this represents information that we're storing about those things, the attributes. The actual visual representation are these paint objects. So, in other words, we're only drawing the stuff on the screen for the user's benefit, right? And so that they can see where the target is, where we can see the cannon. We could actually write this to shoot without drawing on the screen, right? Of course, they wouldn't know what they're aiming at. They wouldn't know if the blocker's in the way. But we could do the math to move the cannonball and determine whether the target was hit or not, regardless of we, whether we drew the stuff on there. So the variables that we looked at before, that's holding all the math of what's going on, the speed that's going and all that. These variables here are the actual... Um, visual representation of the things on the page. And we're going to draw those over and over and over again. All right. Here we're setting up some initialized stuff. We're saying the blocker is a new line, the target is a new line, the cannonball as a new point, initializing the hit states, the sound pool, the sound map. Here we are registering um, the callback listener and, and the context so it knows that this is associated with the particular activity. And here we're going and we're creating the different visual things that are going to be on the page. All right, the text paint, the cannon paint, the cannonball paint, the blocker, the background, and all that. Now, interesting thing is this is the on create, you know, this is this is a constructor for this view. Not the on create method of the activity, my mistake. This is a constructor for this view. We're initializing a lot of variables, but we're not drawing anything yet. All right? We're not drawing anything yet. Why not? Well, there's a method on a surface view called the surface changed or on size changed event that fires off 
when either the size of the view changes or when the view is initialized. So it says, for example, when it's first added to the view hierarchy. So, when we first go and create this view, this on size change event gets fired off and we go and we actually do the drawing. We grab the size uh, of the uh, screen, the width and the height. We calculate how big the base of the radius is. In other words, the base of the cannon is 1 18th of the screen height. The length of the cannon is 1 8th of the screen width. All right. The cannonball radius is 1 36th of the screen width. The cannonball speed multiplier is the width multiplied by 3 over 2. That was just something that they sort of figured that they liked that speed. In other words, they didn't necessarily want it to, you know, uh, they wanted the speed of the cannon to be some sort of function based on the width. In other words, the wider the screen, the faster you wanted the cannonball to go. Because otherwise it would take forever to go across the screen. All right? Or it would zip across um, a, a smaller screen. So the wider the screen, the faster we make it go. We figure out the width of the lines based on the width of the screen again. And so on down the line. So pretty much this on size changed. Remember, it says on size changed, but this also gets fired off when that view gets initialized. What we're doing is, is we're accounting for the fact that there's different screen resolutions. One of the, uh, some of the arguments that get set on this on size change are the new width and height. So when we initialize this, we have the width and height of the screen, and we can go and we can calculate to make all the pieces look the right size. All right? It's something we don't want to hard code. All right? We want to actually calculate it on, on the fly. So we calculate based on the height and width it, and therefore we make the elements on the screen a certain proportion of that. Um, I'll try to remember next class to bring in a different size device so we can see the Canon game, and like the Canon on the smaller screen is going to be obviously a lot smaller. All right? And on the bigger screen it's going to be bigger. After we've done initializing it, so we've set all those parameters, we really haven't drawn anything yet. All right. After we've initialized all those parameters, we call a new game method. What does that new game method do? It goes in and initializes stuff for the game. Two sets of initializations here. One is initializing on the odd si uh, on size change, which again happens when the very first time that we open this app to set the proper size for all those things, there's certain activities we want to do through every game. And so, for example, we loop through and we set all of the hit states to false. We initialize it that we haven't hit any things. We set some initial velocities, the time left, cannonball on the screen. We set all these things. If game over is false, in other words, our game has not started yet, or I'm sorry, the opposite. If game over is true, that is our game has not started yet, we change game over to false, we start our thread, and then we start our cannon thread. Or actually we create our thread, then we start our cannon thread. Now, what is the cannon thread? The cannon thread, again, is what achieves the multi-threading. This is what allows a thread to do the screen manipulation of 
drawing and moving the targets and all that while also sort of keeping an ear on is the user doing uh, anything with the screen. If we scroll down here, we can see the thread. Where is it? Here's the Canon thread. All right. That's a good place to, to leave off today and start next time. All right, because this gets into um, this will get into a lot of stuff about the um, drawing and redrawing of the screen and the thread and all that. But essentially, we took you up to the game starting, which is. right here. All right. When the game starts, we're going to have two threads going. We're going to have a thread for the UI and we're going to have a thread for, by UI, I mean the user um, interface, that is the user making gestures on the screen. And we're also going to have a thread for the movement of the objects on there, the changing of the positions, so that each one will get sufficient time so that they both can coexist and run at the same time without one locking up the other. All right. The other thing, if you think of, it wouldn't be a very good game, for example, if when I shot, all right, if everything stopped, right, and if I didn't have multi-threading, that would happen. If I shot it, if this wasn't done as a multi-thread, the cannonball going across the screen would be going as the rest of the stuff stayed still. So that's not a particularly good, um, I, I would think that that would be the case. I'd have to see actually, would have to look exactly to see how that's coded. I don't recall off the top of my head. But that would be a potential issue with that. Questions up to this point? Okay. Yeah, we, we can talk about it in lab then. All right. All right. We'll pick up on this next time. If I come into class, remind me to bring a couple of different size devices so that we can check to see how this looks on a smaller screen. Oh, really? Yeah, bring it up here. We can do that now, and I don't have to remember to do that. All right, smaller screen. All right, we'll put it. Side by side, hit reset game. Notice again the cannon in the one. Whoops. The cannon in the one, the cannon in the other. The size of that is calculated, and I think that was like 1 18th of the width of the screen or the height of the screen. Notice the blue lines, bigger and smaller. You know, this one, because it's on a much bigger screen, the blue line is much bigger. So again, that's a calculation based on the size of the screen. So, good question. Why is the smaller one going so much slower? Because of the height of the screen. All right. This has more ground to cover. All right. So it has to go faster to get there. All right. This has less ground to cover, so it goes less fast to get there. All right. And again, we could, you know, if you, if you look through, you can see the calculations on how it calculates the velocity, but the velocity is a function of the size of, of the screen. So in a nutshell, that's it. Uh-huh. Yes. It makes a calculation to keep it, yeah, to keep it somewhat consistent. Yep. Are there excess blue and yellow bars? 
Not sure I understand the question. Oh no, that that's just that's just uh, there you go. That's just the way the the dot camera was working. The yellow ones are there all the time. Whoops. Let's go in there. No, the blue and yellow ones get destroyed. The, the blue and yellow simply helps you see how many pieces are left. If it was just a solid blue, it would be unclear if there's three pieces left or four pieces left, for example. So yeah, they alternate the colors. Yeah, the, the not displaying is just a, uh, just a quirk of the, the dot cam. The, the shutter of that. Well, keep in mind is this, this, this app is very, this app is extremely sensitive to the size of the screen. Therefore, we do calculations to do things. Normally, what are you going to do? What you're going to do is you could probably accommodate most of your issues simply by having different resource files. Remember that, for example, we have where we can set images depending on the density of, the, of it. We can have different images. So on a high density, we get a bigger icon than on a lower density. On a lower density, we get a tiny icon. All right, on a high density, we get a big one. So that's a more straightforward way to take into account the differences of this. So in other words, if, we, if I had a, a low density screen and a high density screen, and I installed this app on both, those icons would be roughly the same size, believe it or not, because again, the density of the pixels. I can do the same thing with this layout. The layout that has the XML, in it. I right now just have one layout. So regardless of the screen, I use that one XML. I could actually make a different layout if I had a different screen density or even a different screen size. So I could, for a large screen, I could put more stuff on a screen. It doesn't really apply in this case, but um, you know, if you think of, let's say you have a photo gallery, you know, if you had a large screen, you might be able to display three pictures. So you'd have three image views. If you had a small screen, you're liable to have one picture. All right? And so with the resources file, we can accommodate the different size screen, the different screen resolutions, without programmatically having to do it. This is sort of a very extreme case of programmatically controlling it because of the nature of we're moving things back and forth and, and so on. All right? But a more typical way to handle that for, for more straightforward applications would be to simply use a different resource file for the different sizes and resolutions. All right? Other questions? All right. See you up in lab. No, what is it?